It seems that your repeated assertion that it is by divine justice that the Ahadiths destroy Mohammedan Islam has recently been vindicated by the fatwa, Mohammedan religious ruling, regarding the breastfeeding of a grown man by a grown woman among the believers. Will you please explain? Although the statements that we make are always based upon Mohammedan Muslim authorities, many of our listeners still remain in doubt because of the incredible depravity, immorality or stupidity of many of the subjects that we are investigating. It is hence extremely gratifying when some of the statements that we make are inadvertently further authenticated by some of the highest scholars of Mohammedan Islam. Recently, the head of the Al-Azhar Hadith Department put out a religious opinion called a fatwa, asserting that in Mohammedan Islam, breastfeeding allows a woman to be with a man in private. I shall now read to our listeners the official sequence of events. Dr. Izzat Atiyah explained his fatwa in an interview with al Watan al yawm the weekly of Egypt's ruling National Democratic Front Party. He said, the religious ruling that appears in the Prophet's conduct, Sunnah, confirms that breastfeeding allows a man and a woman to be together in private, even if they are not family, and if the woman did not nurse the man in his infancy before he was weaned, providing that their being together serves some purpose, religious or secular. Being together in private means being in a room with the door closed so that nobody can see them. A man and a woman who are not family members are not permitted to do this because it raises suspicions and doubts. A man and a woman who are alone together are not necessarily having sex, but this possibility exists and breastfeeding provides a solution to this problem. I also insist that the breastfeeding relationship to be officially documented in writing. The contract will state that this woman has suckled this man. After this, the woman may remove her hijab and expose her hair in the man's presence. Dr. Atiyah further explained that the breastfeeding does not necessarily have to be done by the woman herself. The important point, he said, is that the man and the woman must be related through breastfeeding. This can also be achieved by means of the man's mother or sister suckling the woman, or by means of the woman's mother or sister suckling the man, since all of these solutions legally turn them into brother and sister. The logic behind the concept of breastfeeding an adult is to transform the bestial relationship between two people into a religious relationship based on religious duties. Since this breastfeeding takes place between two adults, the man is still permitted to marry the woman who breastfed him, whereas a woman who nursed a man in his infancy is not permitted to marry him. The adult was suckled directly from the woman's breast. This is according to a hadith attributed to Aisha, wife of the Prophet Muhammad, which tells of Salim, the adopted son of Abu Hudayfa, who was breastfed by Abu Hudayfa's wife when he was already a grown man with a beard by the Prophet's order. I shall now confirm the scholar statement based upon the following accepted hadiths. Al-Tirmidhi hadith 3173 narrated by Umm Salama. Allah Messenger said, the only suckling which makes marriage unlawful is that which is taken from the breast and enters the bowels and is taken before the time of weaning. Sahih al-Bukhari hadith 1.88, narrated by Abdullah bin Abi Mulaika. Uqba bin al-Harith said that he had married the daughter of Abi Aziz. Later on, a woman came to him and said, I have suckled, nursed you, Uqba, and the woman whom you married, his wife, at my breast. Uqba said to her, Neither I knew that you have suckled, nursed me, nor did you tell me. Then he rode over to see Allah's Apostle at Medina and asked him about it. Allah's Apostle said, How can you keep her as a wife when it has been said to you that she is your foster sister? Then Uqba divorced her and she married another man. Sahih Muslim Suckling a Young Boy Tradition 3428 Zainab, daughter of Abu Salama, reported, I heard Umm Salama, the wife of Allah's Apostle, saying to Aisha, By Allah, I do not like to be seen by a young boy who has passed the period of ostrich. Whereupon Aisha asked, Why is it so? Umm Salama answered, Because Sahla, daughter of Suhail, came to Allah's Messenger and said, 
Allah Messenger, I swear by Allah that I see in the face of Abu Hudayfa, her husband, the signs of disgust on account of the entering of Salem in the house, whereupon Allah's Messenger said, Suckle him. Sahla said in astonishment, But he has a beard. But Muhammad said again, Suckle him, and it would remove what is there, the expression of disgust on the face of Abu Hudayfa. She said, I suckled him, and by Allah, I did not see any sign of disgust on the face of Abu Hudayfa. Sahih Muslim, suckling a young boy tradition, 3, 4, 2, 6. Ibn Abu Mulaika reported that Al-Qasim bin Abu Bakr had narrated to him that Aisha reported that Sahla bin Suhail bin Amr came to Allah's apostle and said, Messenger of Allah, Salim, the freed slave of Abu Hudayfa, is living with us in our house. And he has attained puberty as men attain it, and has acquired knowledge of the sex problems as men acquire, whereupon he said, suckle him, so that he may become unlawful in regard to having sex with you. Ibn Abu Mulaika continued, I refrained from narrating this hadith for a year or so on account of fear. I met again with Al-Qasim and said to him, you narrated to me a hadith which I did not narrate to anyone afterwards. He said, what is that? I informed him. Whereupon he said, narrated on my authority, that Aisha had narrated that to me. Ladies and gentlemen, believers and unbelievers, here was a man who was afraid to narrate what he had heard and decided to keep this story to himself for more than a year. The man viewed this hadith with obvious trepidation regarding the innocence of this story and knew that there was something morally wrong with this unbelievable event. Even 1400 years ago, this type of story of a grown and married woman who would breastfeed a grown man, not her husband, so that she can be at home, so to speak, while he is around, was so immoral that it boggled the mind of its listener. That is why he kept his mouth shut for almost a year thereafter. But as a believing Mohammedan Muslim, he had to accept it as a divinely sanctioned order. The Azhar Council decided to dismiss the doctor, not because he was telling a lie, but because he was telling the truth, thus exposing Muhammadan Islam to ridicule. They even go so far as to accuse those who support his deductions as perverts. In the light of the aforegoing, then all the preceding Muhammadan scholars must have been perverts since they too read the same hadith and walked away with the same understanding that I do. They saw that the logical implication one derives from them is that Sahla, against her natural instincts, breastfed a young man at the express orders of Muhammad. There are, of course, more hadiths regarding the above, but I'm sure these will suffice. Believers and unbelievers, I shall repeat once again, as I shall do so at every opportunity, that the worst nightmare of Muhammadan Islam is knowledge of the Quran, of the hadiths, and all their related subjects. Muhammadan Islam can only survive through subjugation, intimidation, terror, indoctrination, and the ignorance of its followers. They are, after all, its worst and foremost innocent victims. We have repeatedly made it crystal clear that the objective of this series is not to insult, humiliate, or degrade the followers of Muhammad, the so-called believers, but to enlighten them as well as all those so-called unbelievers around the world. Believers, all that we have ever asked you to do is to use your God-given faculties to think independently for yourselves, to read and investigate the very Bible that the Quran asserts was revealed directly to Moses and the Gospels to Jesus. Why depend on or accept the mullahs or anybody else's versions that are passed on to you with deliberate falsifications? You should at least ask yourselves why you are forbidden from studying the scriptures of other peoples, especially if the Qur'an is allegedly so superior to them. If the Qur'an is so superior, then you should not be afraid or hesitate from reading them. What could you possibly lose? After all, we are repeatedly told by the scholars of Muhammad and Islam that the Qur'an loves knowledge. So learn, and hence, unchain your minds and liberate your souls.